Hey everyone, this is Christopher Luxon, the former CEO of Air New Zealand. This is John Lee Dumas, the founder and host of Entrepreneurs on Fire. This is Tracy Ibarra. I'm an executive solutions at Dell Technologies. This is Travis Chappell, founder of Build Your Network. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change to navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast. The Leadership is Changing podcast. The Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, my very good friend, Dennis Giannoutsos. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsos. Thanks, Dennis. I appreciate you having me on the show, and I'm truly excited to discuss leadership and uh, helping all of your many members around the world who listen to your podcast. Uh, I'm looking forward to making a difference in their thinking around leadership and what's next in today's situation. Yeah, excellent. So I've given quite a bit of an a, a introduction on you. Is there anything else in your background you might like to share? Nothing specific, Dennis. Thank you for that introduction again. Um, the only thing I would add is that uh, I really do consider myself a true global citizen of the world. Uh, mm-hmm. I've obviously been born and brought up in India, uh, but I've had the opportunity to live in the United States in the Bay Area, where we are headquartered as a company in Palo Alto for a couple of years. Um, I've experienced the um, Catalan lifestyle in Barcelona for a few years. I was based in Spain, uh, experience which I absolutely loved. And uh, I've also moved uh, around Asia. So I spent a couple of years in Singapore. And probably the stint, I would say, that you know taught me the most from a learning perspective uh, was in China. I had the opportunity to um, lead, manage three uh, global delivery centers in China. And probably, I would say, out of my 24 years, if I was to pick out one experience that truly made a difference to me, uh, was really working with uh, our China team. And uh, I think China gave me a, a, a very different learning experience uh, compared to the Western countries. Yeah, it's great to be able to have these different experiences and different cultures as you travel the world and, and leading different teams. And I remember seeing you either at the gym at the hotel that we may have been staying in Palo Alto, or I was at the gym and just coming out and you were going to the office. And so we sort of edge each other on to go to the gym, which was really good. Yeah. Maya, the question here for you is, uh, how did you get into leadership? I think that's a very interesting uh, question, uh, Dennis, because um, I truly believe that my journey into leadership uh, was all because I had a manager, supervisor in Hewlett Packard who saw it worthwhile to take a risk with me uh, when I was extremely young in the company, actually. I was just finished three years in the company. It was not very often that somebody with three years of experience was given a people management responsibility, which in many ways... I think the transition from being an individual contributor to a people manager, however small that is, I think it's one of the most significant transitions that you can make. And I was fortunate that I had a manager who, despite what I believe now on hindsight was maybe not sufficient experience on my side at that point of time, she still took the risk and uh, made me a people manager of a very small team. And that was basically my first foray into leadership because all of my team members were a lot more experienced than me. And India, culturally, you know, there is a lot of importance given to how many years of experience uh, a candidate comes with. So I was one of the most junior members of the team, but still uh, the manager, again, I reiterate, took the risk to make me a people manager. And that first role actually taught me a lot about leadership and what it means to manage people. Obviously, even in my first role itself, I did encounter some resistance because... Uh, you know, not everyone immediately bought into the thought of me being a people manager, uh, but that taught me a lot. And that was my first foray into leadership. Dance. That's interesting how you talk about there was a little bit of resistance, especially probably because you were young, only three years into the role. And then all of a sudden, next minute, da-da, you're a leader. Yeah. And I'll be going like, what? So how did you handle that resistance? What did you do to get around it? Yeah, I think, you know, when you go through any change, uh, whether it's for yourself or in a team, I think the first aspect of managing any change is to come to acceptance that the change is happening. 
So one mm. of the things I did was I really put myself in the shoes of my team members and I said that if this was happened to me, probably I would react in the same manner. And then my whole thought process from there on was how do I build that trust and credibility with my team members for them to feel that I'm a worthy choice as a leader. And I believe it was around six months down the line in that particular role when one of the team members, actually the team member that was most resistive to be being a manager, uh, she actually made a pretty big blunder with a project that we were working on, which got escalated uh, to the uh, director of our division. And uh, I clearly remember that, you know, this, this blunder came out by surprise on a call and um, the person asked on the call that, you know, who has done this work? How could we have made such a big mistake? It was basically a Excel sheet error that had happened on a fairly large financial calculation. And I don't know what prompted me to do this again on hindsight, but instead of pointing to one of the team members, I said that it doesn't matter who did it. I am the manager of this team and I take accountability for the mistake. And even when I was pressed to a certain extent to tell who did it, I did not give up the name of the person. I just kept telling the director saying, let's not get into that. You have given me the charter to manage this team and I take full accountability. I should have reviewed it before this reached you. And this lady actually, after the call, she almost was on tears. Uh, she came and told me that I'm sorry I made this mistake, but I'm really full of admiration the way you stood up to me. And the fact that you took the bullet on my behalf shows me why you have got this role and position. So I think, you know, that word kind of then spread around that there's a guy who can rely on. He's not going to let his team down. And that was how I went about building trust and respect with the team. Fantastic. So knowing that a leader has your back and just the beautiful story that you shared there you know, in relation to some resistance, and that was probably one of the ladies, there were the people in the team that were probably more resistant than others. And when it came to time, because the finger was about to be pointed, you chose not to do that, but also stood up as a leader and said, I take accountability because I'm the leader and uh, let's not get stuck in the weeds, let's move forward. And I think, Maya, that's that's a true sort of indication of the leader that you are and uh, and well done in doing that. So that's fantastic. So good to see. Thanks, sir. Thanks, yeah. yeah, cool. Here's a question for you, and that is, who's your favorite leader? Now, this person can be alive or can be from history. So who's your favorite leader and why? So given the country I come from, uh, uh, Dennis, uh, for a very long time, and you know I've read up a lot on this person, Gandhi has been a favorite uh, leader of mine for the longest time. Obviously, growing up in India, we are all taught to respect and we learn a lot about Mahatma Gandhi. But it's only when you grow up and then you encounter situations of resistance, you encounter situations of anger, bitterness, uh, you realize what a profound man he was to lead a country as diverse as India, which speaks around 80 different languages. People with various cultural backgrounds uh, are there in India. To unite a country as diverse as India into a common vision goal, and you do that on top of this whole concept of nonviolence that he had, to get freedom from the British. Gandhi has been a long-standing leader. And, um, you know, I recently, and I really want to share this with all the uh, viewers, Dennis, because I would say over the last two years, it's kind of had a profound uh, impact on me as well. Through Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, I was given an executive level coach around two years back who coached me for around six months since I was getting ready for a larger global role within the organization. And uh, he asked me the same question and he said that going forward, what I want you to do, because I was giving him one or two examples of, you know, challenges I was encountering at work and uh, how do I overcome it? And he told me that every time you have a particular challenge, he asked me the same question, who is your role model? And I said, my role model is Gandhi. And he said that every time you have a challenge at work, I want you to think about what Gandhi would have done in this kind of situation. And initially, when the coach told me this, I laughed him off like, you know, you know, how can you even expect me to rise to a level of mental thinking, foresight to a man like that in terms of what he would have done? I said, you know, all I'm doing is I'm a corporate, <laughs> I have sales targets, I run after it every quarter. I said, you can't expect me to rise to the level of 
what would Gandhi have done in that kind of situation? But he kept pressurizing me. So every time I would go to him with a challenge, he said, okay, you know, tell me if Gandhi was faced with this problem, what would he do? And he took me through this wonderful process of putting myself in the shoes of a visionary leader and forcing myself to think like him. And that's also, I would say, made a big difference to me over the last couple of years. Uh, I started my career basically in finance. So one of the the great advantages of uh, being a senior HR leader these days is everything is about fin- financials. And so having the first 16, 17 years of my career in finance, a variety of roles uh, from you know accounting to finance to M&A um, really gave me a strong foundation to really understand business. And, and these days, doesn't matter which function you're in, you need to be able to talk the language of business. You need to understand what your business is trying to accomplish, even if you're in HR. And so and then I spent about the next uh, five or so years in general management and sales kind of roles and, uh, and spent some wonderful time at some great companies, GE, at uh, Stanford Research Institute, Deloitte, and uh, of course, HP, where I spent almost 15 years. And when I made my transition into, into HR, when you and I got to know each other. I lived all over the world. I've lived in Singapore, uh, spent a lot of time in Europe. Um, and of course, I spent most of my time in California and now here in Milwaukee. And then, and then, oh, and then I, when I left HP, I did a few startups and uh, some went well, some didn't go so well. And now I'm here at Northwestern Mutual and I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. And when you turn around, well, we'll just talk before about the HR and having that business knowledge. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that what I see uh, of, of late, and I, I know you and I have talked about this before, whereby if you're in the HR side of things and you bring that business experience in, you have a different credibility in mm-hmm. front of those business leaders. Is, is that true? And, and how have you got people to get that business experience and coming into the HR space? Well, I mean, the reason why it, it's it's a very important is because ultimately business leaders are trying to achieve business outcomes. You're mm-hmm. not doing things related to HR for HR's sake. You're doing it to achieve business outcomes. So if you have an understanding and can speak in a language that business leaders understand, they're going to they're gonna quickly understand that you get what they're trying to do and they're going to resonate to what you're talking about. And so you can build that credibility much faster. You know, I've had a big advantage of that because I spent about half my career so 35 years of my career and about half of it in finance and general management, about half of it in HR. So it's much more natural to me. When, when, when I see people that have only spent their entire career in HR, one of the things that I try to do is put them in roles where they actually have to really understand the business and get to know the business a little bit better and get them that experience, get them exposed to workforce planning, get them exposed to budgeting, get them exposed to some of the areas um, so that they start to understand the business better. In fact, I tell people all the time, how are you going to recruit for, develop talent, identify talent and so forth if you don't understand what the business is trying to accomplish? So that's, you know, those are some of the things. But clearly, when I look for talent that I'm trying to recruit, especially, especially externally, I'm looking for people that have had a little bit more than just HR experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and Don, when you uh, talked about your career and going from finance and then into general management, that what got you into leadership? Well, I think, you know, listen, I think one of the reasons that I've been able to ascend in my career and, and, and achieve things is I've always really focused on what is the business trying to accomplish. And, and, and I was always had a big, strong affinity for then, therefore, what talent do you need to make it happen? I mean, you know, now we all recognize that it's all about talent, the talent wars. And but many years ago, it wasn't so much that way. People were people saw talent. And, and individuals as anybody can do anything. And it's it's a lot more, you better make sure that people have the skills and capability. It's less about the relationship. It's less about the familiarity. Those are important, but it's more about what is the skill? What is the capability? What is the experience that person has? What do you need to accomplish? And I just always felt like I was really pretty good at actually recognizing talent, in, especially early in their career. Like you give me somebody that is smart, because I can't make you smart, somebody with good energy, because I can't give you energy, and somebody with a positive attitude, I can coach and teach you anything. But if you have those three things, you have the intellectual horsepower, you have the energy, and you have the positivity and how you look at things, the, the, the possibilities are endless. And so I just really enjoyed developing and growing and getting to know talent and, being, and, and giving people chances and opportunities. And I think leadership today is much more about recognizing talent and putting them in positions of success and identifying people early in their careers who have the capabilities and and having more of a plan for how you're going to grow and develop folks rather than just have things happen by accident. 
Yeah. Hey, listeners, a powerful combination. Don's just shared with us there about being, you know, you've, the people are smart uh, with the energy, the right energy, and also the right attitude. If you can bring that combination together and recognize that talent right up front or even earlier in the career, but then give them a pathway for them to go and excel, uh, that's a great thing. And that's also a really strong responsibility of a leader to mm -hmm. do today and, uh, and make sure we do that. Hey, Don, I've got a question here, which is, who's your favorite leader? Now, this person can be alive or can be from history. Who's your favorite leader and why? Well, let me talk about a leader that I actually got a chance to work with. Um, he's no longer with us, but Jack Wells, a GE. And let me just say up front, Jack wasn't, wasn't the nicest guy. But the thing I loved about Jack and why I admired him as a leader is there are two things that I think a leader has to have to be, to be really a legacy type leader. One is they have to have a vision. They have to be able to see out in front of where their business is going. What do you need to do? You need to be out in front and leading. And one of the things that was, gr was great about Jack, he was one of the very early CEOs who really understood the power of developing successors and developing a talent pool and having this absolute responsibility as a leader to develop future leaders. But he not only had, had, had the vision, he had the, he had the, uh, the, the con courage of his conviction to execute on it. Jack, you know, if he didn't think you were going to be somebody that could be the next leader, he didn't think twice about moving you to the side or putting you somewhere else. Oftentimes, leaders today, they know the right thing to do, but they don't oftentimes have the conviction and the courage to do it because uh -huh. either they have a relationship, it's a friend, it's somebody in their network, somebody's been here a long time, oh, they deserve the opportunity. Jack was ruthless in his, in, in his, uh, in his ability to execute against his vision because he always kept in mind the, 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 the ultimate goal, which is to really develop future leaders. And he didn't care where you came from, who you were, what your background was. He kept cared about, did you have the, the, the skill set and really the capability? And so uh, I just always admired how, he's had, how he had that ability. And frankly, I think it's one of the things that leaders, many leaders could be great leaders struggle with. They know the right thing to do, but do you have the courage to do it? Yeah, and the courage of actually having that conversation, making that decision, right. getting on with it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but I think the other thing that I'm sort of picking up as well about Jack Welsh and what you're saying is whatever he was doing, it's, it was always consistent. Correct. And if you're if you've got the courage and the consistent side of things, that that's that's another very powerful tool to to have up in our in our sleeves as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Now the show is called Leadership is Changing, and that term uh, leadership is changing. When I say that, what what does that mean for you, Don? Well, I think I think years ago, being a leader meant you had a big title, you had the hierarchy. It was always everybody was chasing the brass ring. It was, you know, and I, I tell people all the time, everybody wants the compensation and the title and the privileges of leadership, but m many times people don't really want the responsibility of leadership. Um, right. Today, leaders, to me, to be a great leader, you have to be first and foremost, a multiplier of talent. You have mm -hmm. to be the, you have to be someone who is identifying talent, growing talent, uh, you know, mentoring talent, recognizing talent and moving talent around the organization. You know, oftentimes if we have a great person that works for us, we don't want to let them go. But the responsibility you have is to seed the rest of the organization with great talent that you develop and grow and develop. And I think, you know, it's not so much anymore about your title and your trappings. Those things still are important, but it's more about the experience that you have, the, the ability to recognize and grow talent. And, and, and often, and it's important that when you put somebody in a leadership position, that they do have the experience that it's okay that they are, are um, maybe a little green or maybe they're not quite ready. But let me give you an example. You know, oftentimes I'll see leaders get moved into a position and they don't have the experience to draw from to know what to do in situations. And, and you know, they may know intuitively what to do, but if mm. you don't have real life examples of where you've dealt with it, it's hard sometimes to be able to do it. A great example is, hey, Dennis, you know how to drive a car, right? And yep. you drive on the opposite side of the road as, as I do. Oh, um, you mean on the, on, on the right side of the road? Yeah, the yeah. right side of the road. <laughs> but um, you, um, you, and you know your area and you go to work, you drive to your grocery store, you drive yes. home. But if I took you and dropped you in the middle of South America, 
you still know how to and put you in a car that you never drove before on the other side of where you drive right now and told you to go to a location. You still intuitively know how to drive. But as you're as you're getting in the car, you're not familiar with how it operates. As you're moving to where you're going to next, you have to look at maps. You're slower. You're not as because you haven't done it before. But after a few months in that location, you would be just as efficient as you are where you are. Yeah. So the more that we have actual tangible experiences to draw from, the quicker our ability to ramp, the quicker our ability to react, the more the more we're able to use our our more advanced part of our brain rather than just a rudimentary part. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world.